Good morning, North Keithville. Y'all glad to be here this morning? I had a lot of, a lot of folks strung out all over the, the sanctuary this morning. That's some good stuff. If you did not make it to adult Sunday school this morning, you were certainly missing out. Um, Ruslan and I can both attest to that because uh, Brother David managed to call both of us out during the Sunday school class. So if you want to see the Sunday school teacher make fun of some of the other church members, you just be on back here next Sunday. All right. Let's open up a word of prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you that, that we can gather together in your house, Lord, to hear what you have to say for us each time that we gather. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds. Lord, just, just let us take in the message that you have for us today so that we can take it outside the walls of this church this week. Lord, we pray for those church members who are not here with us this morning. Lord, for whatever reason it may be, Lord, just uh, pray that you would be with them, give them strength, give them comfort. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, many of us that are here today, we either live out in the country or maybe you grew up out in the country right you're at least in the country this morning because this is a country church I want to start today with some country words of wisdom you may have heard some of these country words of wisdom you maybe already know those you may remember your parents or your grandparents sharing some of this country wisdom with you when you were a kid so here we go. Keep skunks and lawyers at a distance. Life is easier when you plow around the stumps. An angry bee is faster than a 40 horsepower tractor. Don't skinny dip with snapping turtles. Teachers Mothers and hoot owls all sleep with one eye open. <laughs> Forgive your enemies. It messes with their head. Don't sell your mule to get the money to buy a new plow. Think that one through. It makes sense. Don't corner anything that is meaner than you are. It don't take a very big person to hold a grudge. You can't unsay a cruel word. Every path in life will have a few puddles. Most of the stuff people worry about never actually happens. And the last one, the best sermons are lived, not preached. Now those are excellent words of wisdom for life. And I am almost convinced that the Apostle Paul originally came up with just a few of those. Paul, in this passage we're going to be in today, he shares some wisdom about life that we should take note of. If you hadn't figured out, we're, we're back in Galatians. Those words of wisdom that Paul shares with us can help us make our way in this earthly life. So turn with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to begin reading in verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
So what's Paul telling us there? He starts out, he says, walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? That means that life is easier when you plow around the stumps. Now in the beginning, man had a perfect relationship and a perfect fellowship with God. But due to the lies and the deceit of our adversary, the devil, Satan, and the actions of man, that relationship, that fellowship was short-lived. Now we first learn about the fall of man in the book of Genesis, right? When Adam and Eve fell to temptation. And they ate of that forbidden fruit. They fell to what? The lust of the flesh. 1 John 2.16 says this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. From that point forward, the appetite of the flesh began to dominate man. And as this passage says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Man no longer had the same relationship with God but instead sought to satisfy the appetite of the flesh. Man no longer had the same fellowship that he once had with God. And now, sin had entered the world. God placed law into effect so that man could see and understand what was not acceptable. To point our sins out to us. Remember we learned this back earlier in, in Galatians. To make us aware that we are sinners against God. And that we're not in a right, right and proper relationship with Him. The law was put into place due to man's desire of the flesh. Man's sinful nature. 1 Timothy 1.9 says this, The law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners. Now we read back in, in Galatians 4, and it said this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. He sent Jesus so that we would have the opportunity for a spiritual rebirth. Man was dead in sin. But guess what? Man can be born again. Adopted. We saw that. Is something else that Paul shared with us in Galatians. Can be adopted. Children of God. So that we're able to walk in the Spirit. As Paul is sharing with us here now in chapter 5. If you've come to salvation, if you've come to faith in Jesus, you're justified and declared righteous in the eyes of God Listen to me, by God Himself. Isn't that good? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, dwells inside you, the believer. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned it's now that the believer can fellowship with God the lust of the flesh 
that sinful nature that man inherited from Adam, it's still there. But you have a new nature. The believer received at salvation. The Holy Spirit that indwells the believer is there to stand in the way. Just because you have come to salvation don't, does not mean that you will no longer be tempted by the lust of the flesh. The believer must remember to depend on the Spirit, on the Holy Spirit for guidance and direction in this life. We learned last week that liberty in Christ is not a license to sin. If we don't remember to, to make a conscious decision to depend on the Holy Spirit, we can become easy prey for those lusts of the flesh. Those sins that are crouching in the shadows, those are the stumps in your life. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to get rid of a stump in your yard, but it's not very easy. If you're going to try to burn it out, you're going to have to create a lot of fires. It's going to take a lot of time. You can go get you a backhoe or something, try to dig it up. That's not going to be real easy either, is it? Sometimes it's easier if you just go around the stump. Being led by the Spirit signifies the Holy Spirit going before you, guiding you, directing your course, blazing a trail in your life. If you're living in such a way, you're not living under the law. You're being led by the Spirit. Life is easier when you depend on the Holy Spirit to help you plow around the stumps in your life. Let's keep going in Galatians, starting in 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's given a warning. A warning about works of the flesh. What's he telling us? Every path in your life will have a few puddles. Here in this passage, Paul gives us a short list of works of the flesh. Kind of seemed like a long list, didn't it? But that's actually a short list. How do we know that? Because he said, and the like. We could spend a little bit of time and we could add quite a few more works of the flesh, could we not? But we get his point with the list that he provided us. He says it's evident it should be plainly understood that these are works of the flesh. Some of these are sexual sins, such as adultery and fornication. Some are superstitious sins, such as idolatry and sorcery. Some are social sins, such as envy and selfish ambition. But all of them have to do with pleasing self. All of them have to do with pleasing self. A focus on self instead of a focus on God. These are the things that the believer should steer clear from. 
Jesus gave his life to redeem you from those sins. Calling them dead works. Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We're to take these works of the flesh and put them to death. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It is by and through the Holy Spirit that the believer can put aside, can put to death, these deeds of the body. These lusts of the flesh. Paul says, I have told you guys time and time again that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, if you're guilty of the sins on this list that Paul just gave us, you're not giving an outward appearance of having received salvation. Wait a minute, preacher. I'm guilty of a handful of those since I've come to, to know Jesus. Are you saying I'm not saved? Are you saying that I, I have lost my salvation? You're saying that I'm not saved because I fell prey to some of these things that Paul shared with us? There's not a single person in here today that can cross all of those things off of their list. That they have not been guilty of some of them since they came to salvation. We're all sinners. Many of us sinned before we ever got here this morning. Every believer at some point will experience a lapse into the flesh. Look at that word. Look at how, how Paul shares this with us. Look at that word practice. Paul says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He is saying that a person who without conscience, having no conscience about it, habitually and continually practices the works of the flesh shows no evidence of the Holy Spirit indwelling in their heart. They are in blatant rebellion against God and likely have never come to salvation. The believer will lapse into works of the flesh. There's a continual battle in the life of the believer. That's why it is important for new believers to be immersed in discipleship. We don't realize how important that is sometimes. Many believe that once they come to know Jesus, that life's going to be smooth sailing from here forward. The earthly life is just going to be grand because they came to know Jesus. They need to understand that there is a continual battle in the life of the believer. There's going to be thoughts of God and there will be thoughts of the flesh. Every path in this life will have a few puddles. Brother David talked about this last Sunday in Sunday school. And the kids are learning about this psalm in children's church. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know that psalm, right? That's why it is important for the believer to yield to the Holy Spirit in their lives. 
The Holy Spirit is the presence of the Lord in your life. That is an awesome statement. The Holy Spirit is the presence of the Lord in your life. He's there to guide you with his rod, with his staff, offering you correction, offering you direction. For what? To help you plow around the stumps. What's the believer to do when works of the flesh flare up in their lives? If you fall prey to works of the flesh, you repent. And then you get back in step with the Lord. When temptations are all around you, you go to your closet and you pull out the armor of God. And you make a stand through the Spirit. Stand firm. Hadn't we heard Paul say that multiple times? Paul has reminded us elsewhere. Stand firm. Make a stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's finish up this passage. Start in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another envying one another. So what's Paul sharing in, in this part, in this passage here? He's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. What's he saying? He is saying that the best sermons are lived, not preached. Notice that the works of the flesh that we've been talking about this morning, that's works, that's plural. Okay? And, and we looked at the whole list of, of what Paul shared with us. But he says here in this passage, he says fruit. And fruit can be singular, can it? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Love. Just like we saw last week when Paul said the law is fulfilled in one word. Love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. That's the two greatest commandments that Jesus shared, right? All of the other things from this list that we just read from Paul flow from that love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They all flow from love. He says there's no law against doing any of that. The believer is no longer under the law. And if you're loving the way the Lord wants you to love, there's no law against doing things on that list. On that second list that he shared with us. When you think of that word work, what does that bring to mind? kind of brings to mind manual labor, does it? doesn't it? Manual labor of some sort. Fruit, on the other hand, what do you think of when you think of fruit? You think of something to eat. And fruit has something inside it. Fruit has seeds inside of it. What do you do if you plant those seeds from that fruit? You get more fruit, right? 
John 15, verses 1 and 2. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. That old sinful nature that you had prior to coming to know Jesus didn't produce any fruit, did it? But you're a new person now. The Holy Spirit dwells inside you. And you are now able to produce fruit. When I think of fruit, I think of dessert. Like a pie. Something like that. That's what I think of when I think of fruit. What kind of recipe can you think of where fruit's an ingredient? We associate fruit with food. There are lost people out there that are hungry. And we have food. They're hungry for something, but sometimes they just don't know what they're hungry for. They could be filling that void with works of the flesh. What they're really hungry for is Jesus. Use that fruit of the Spirit and feed them. Feed them love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, self-control. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you so you can lead them to the Savior. If you walk in the Spirit and generate the fruit of the Spirit, the flesh will not win. If you've come to saving grace, the Holy Spirit resides in you. You have the presence of the Lord everywhere you go. The Holy Spirit fills space in your heart. But here's my question. How much space does the Holy Spirit take up in your heart? Are there areas in your heart where you have put up a no trespassing sign? The Holy Spirit's allowed here and here and here, but this area of my heart is off limits to the Spirit. We talked about this recently. Multiple times, I think. We're to be filled with with the Spirit, overflowing with the Spirit. Like that new wineskin that we talked about. We're to be filled with the Spirit, let that information ferment a little bit, stretch a little bit, and then add some more. It's a continual process in our walk with the Lord. The Christian walk is not always a walk in the park on a sunny day. The Christian walk is a battle. And there are minds on that battlefield. The battle is between the flesh and the spirit. Paul says, those who are Christ have been crucified, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does that mean? Romans 6, 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. When the believer comes to saving grace, they nail the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross. Now listen to me, that desire to rebel against God is still alive because the believer is still alive. It's nailed in place, but it's alive. Since it's still alive, we need some help. 
The Lord provided the believer with a comforter. The Holy Spirit. We must remember to rely on the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who will lead the believer to obey God's Word. If we're walking in the Spirit, our desires will oppose the desires of the flesh. If we're walking in the Spirit. If we allow Him, the Holy Spirit will transform us to look more and act more like Jesus. And that's what others will see in us. They'll see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If that's what others see in you, it brings God the glory. Now Paul wraps up this passage with a warning. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Why would Paul choose to close this passage with a warning like that? It's been a very powerful passage so far. So why would, why would Paul close this passage with a warning like that? Because the Christian walk is a battlefield. Because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Because the sinful nature uh, of our old self is still alive. It may be nailed to the cross, but it's still alive. Satan doesn't like it when God gets the glory, does he? He doesn't like it when others see things in your life like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The devil, that liar and deceiver, he can't have you because you belong to God. But he loves to throw some minds out there on the battlefield so other people will not see Christ in you. Can man become conceited? Look at me. I'm living in the Spirit. I am walking in the Spirit. Look at me. You should be more like me. Do we sometimes... Envy? Man, look at that guy right there. He's living in the Spirit. Look at him. He's walking in the Spirit. I envy him. Man, I wish I could be more like that guy. Do you see why it's so important to allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide through this life? It's all about Jesus. And we may do a good job on our own for a minute or for a day. But the desires of the flesh are still there. The Holy Spirit's focus is on Jesus. Period. There is no works of the flesh or desire of the flesh with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired the human authors of the Bible to write about who? Jesus. The Holy Spirit works in us to make us more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit works to place our focus on Jesus. A husband will drive around lost for hours and be too stubborn to use the GPS on their telephone 
or the GPS that came built inside that newer model automobile that you may have. Why? Ladies, are you listening? Just because we don't have a reason. They don't want to turn it on. They don't want to admit they have no clue what direction they're going. <laughs> the Lord provides the believer with a built-in GPS. The Holy Spirit to guide you through this life. The Holy Spirit is there. All the programming is up to date in that GPS. He has the road map to lead you around all the stumps and through all the puddles in your life. But you've got to flip the switch. You've got to push the button. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. When we began this morning, I shared some old country words of wisdom. And I still kind of think the Apostle Paul came up with just a few of those. Life is easier when you plow around the stumps. Allow the Holy Spirit to be your guide in life. Directing you around the stumps. Every path in life has a few puddles. The Christian walk is not a walk in the park on a sunny day. It's a battlefield. And there are minds out there on that battlefield. The battle is between the flesh and the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to walk you through those puddles. The best sermons are lived, not preached. If you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you, if you live in the Spirit and you walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will transform you to look more and act more like Jesus which brings God the glory. If you're striving to live your life in such a manner, you'll be pointing others to Jesus. That has more impact than a, than a preacher preaching 24-7 from now to next New Year's, guys. Best sermons are lived, not preached. Take down that do not disturb sign that you have in that one little section of your heart that you've never allowed the Holy Spirit to access before. Spend time in the Word. Allow the Spirit to guide you, direct you around the stumps. Stretch a little bit so you can be filled more and more. You're going to have some difficult times in this battlefield of life. I assure you. The Spirit will guide you through those puddles. Let's strive to do as Paul urges, to live and to walk in the Spirit. If you do, your life will be a sermon to others and hopefully point them to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this message. Lord, you sent your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to dwell in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we can remember to allow the Holy Spirit to just encompass that whole space. Lord, just, just overflowing and that we'll allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.